Dear ladies and uh, gentlemen, uh, good afternoon, good evening, good morning, uh, depending on the time zone you are living in. Uh, we warmly welcome all of you to our 52nd um, IDDF HPD uh, Table Tennis at Your Fingertips webinar uh, with the topic um, Physical Testing Needs in Table Tennis today. And uh, we will get to know uh, very, very much about uh, what is needed to do so, and of course also uh, what is reasonable, you know, uh, regarding the, the time you will spend with the testing and also, of course, uh, the money which is needed. Um, but uh, before going over to the introduction uh, of our guest of today, I would like to talk now with you um, briefly about the webinar code of the Q&A. So, uh, first of all, we kindly ask you to um, put all your questions, to leave all your questions in the Q&A section of the, of the webinar. And um, of course, uh, our guest, uh, our dear guest will try to answer as many as possible in the question and answer part after each part. Thank you very much for taking care of this. And now it's time uh, to introduce you to our guest uh, of today. And uh, he's a very well-known guest uh, in our ITTF HPD webinars, educational sessions, wherever. And of course, also a great uh, sports science expert and very well known worldwide. And I would like to warmly welcome the one and only uh, Dr. Samuel A. Pullinger, PhD, CSCI from UK. Um, something related to his education. Uh, he did his PhD in sports and exercise physiology at the Liverpool John Moores University in UK, uh, regarding the, his, uh, let's say, experiences and exercise uh, physiologist and research committee member. He was uh, <coughs> active at the Liverpool John Moores University from 2010 till 2014. And uh, currently, um, he is working for the Aspire Academy, which is located in Doha in Qatar and he has started to work for them from 2015 on. Uh, furthermore, he is a lecturer and he was a lecturer in exercise physiology at the uh, Liverpool John Muir's University from 2012 till 2015 and uh, currently still uh, doing it for the University of Split from starting from 2018 on till the present moment. Uh, he is a postgraduate student supervisor, a basis SE supervisor and reviewer. And you can uh, find a lot about him uh, on ResearchGate, Google Scholar and LinkedIn. So hello and welcome, uh, Samuel. Nice to see you. Thank you very much for the introduction, Dominic. And I look forward to, uh, to giving you my presentation. Thank you very much, uh, dear Samuel, for your kind welcoming words from your side. And uh, now I would like to pass uh, the mic and the floor to our well-known ITDF HP elite coach, Massimo Costantini. So, Max, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Dominique. Thank you, Dominique. Thank you, uh, Samuel. 52, 52 webinars uh, exploring again and again the vast universe of uh, table tennis and uh, uh, the performance around. Uh, today, we have a great opportunity to, to, to hear from, uh, from Samuel. Uh, one of the very popular topic, but uh, we don't talk enough about this topic. Uh, so the testing in uh, uh, physical uh, physical preparation. So we know how important is the physical um, attitude and preparation, but we don't know much about how we can uh, we can prepare our players. So today is amazing opportunity to 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 hear from him. And I look forward to, to, to see and hear the presentation. And I hope you will like uh, uh, his presentation. Thank you very much for now. And uh, uh, Samuel is uh, green, Microsoft, Microsoft, micro, microphone is <laughs> uh, all yours. Please go ahead. Thank you very much. Let me just uh, share my screen.
Bear with me two seconds. Let me open it up again. Can you see that? No. Bear with me. No, not yet. It's not showing up on the uh, on the window. What can you see now? Now it's fine, but uh, okay. I, see, I see the tab, so yeah. I will the just hide them with the uh, with the thing because unfortunately it's not showing the window. So I'll I'll proceed okay. in this way. Uh, okay. Anyway, thank you very much for the for the introduction and and the kind words. I'm sure most of you uh, know of me. Or know a few of the other presentations which I've 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 done, uh, but today I wanted to focus on the physical testing needs uh, that we require in table tennis, and I will explain a little bit more now what we will cover and what I would like you to to learn from this. Uh, so first things first, outline of the uh, lecture. So before we proceed with any uh, discussion regarding fitness testing and, and the requirements of testing. There's things that we first need to cover, and, and the first things that we'll cover are these table tennis needs. So we'll do this by looking at a needs analysis, uh, and then we'll also look at a performance-based model of an athlete versus a coach, and delve a little bit into the coaching model and, and, and why we should use a specific coaching model when it comes to uh, table tennis or any other sport for that matter. Uh, after we've done this, we'll go into the physical testing uh, requirements in table tennis. So what are the criteria of testing? What tests should we use and why? And then what do the results actually mean and how we can use this to improve our evidence-based evidence coaching? Uh, so from a learning outcomes perspective, what I want you to be able to take home is be able to create a performance-based model of a table tennis athlete or the athletes that you're working with, uh, to be able to establish a comprehensive understanding of the needs, the issues of table tennis training and competition, because these differ quite greatly, and then also understand what each performance measure or performance test is actually measuring and what it means, and to then integrate your findings or the findings of your, your athletes and your tests into your coaching model. Uh, so first, let's talk a little bit about table tennis and what we actually know. Well, we're all aware that the modern sport of table tennis is very complex and very invasive. So it's not actually so easy. Um, we require a great aerobic and anaerobic capacity to cope with the physical requirements of matches and also the physical requirements of training. Because as we know, training in duration tends to be very, very long, but matches are far shorter and, and differ compared to the training that we actually provide to our athletes. Um, then again, a high level of physical fitness will aid our athletes with recovery, reduce their injury risk and actually enable them to perform at the highest level or at a high level for a duration of time. So a little, a little bit of a disclaimer from my side. So we know that lack of planning, lack of vision and not using logical structures is what can stop us from becoming great coaches, great practitioners or great players. Gone are the times, I hope, 
when a coach turns up to training call and just thinks, okay, today we will perform these exercises. So I'd expect most people to have some form of plan and some form of idea of what they're actually targeting with their training program. Again, most of the coaches which I've worked with, uh, whether it be table tennis or other sports, tend to have all the information in their heads. But it's very important as coaches that we, that we communicate and that we structure this information so everyone can understand it. So this means even with our players, why are we doing specific exercises or specific drills and how will this actually help our performance so it's important that we can provide this information and that we communicate it to our athletes so what are some of the things that we can actually do to improve all this well as coaches we usually know where we want to go so we usually know that we're doing specific exercises specific drills to help uh, become better in these specific aspects. Normally, we also have a good idea of how we should get there, so what we should do and how we should do it, but we should expect some form of failure along the way. So failing is not always a bad thing. And why is it not a bad thing? Because failure should be our teacher, not our undertaker. So when we're failing with specific things, we should actually learn from this and not let it affect us negatively. And then again, failure is delay, not defeat. So this is very important to understand. So if we have a little bit of a look at our coaching approach. So when we have a look at a coaching approach, we go through the coaching approach, we should have a performance need or a performance model. Once we have a full understanding of our athletes, of our sport, we should analyze the level of the athletes that we're working with, and then this will affect our training uh, methodology, which then defines our training means, which helps us to develop our training program, and then we control and review the adaptations based on our findings. So what I want to focus on before we go into analyzing the athlete's level through fitness testing is this performance need or performance model. Because prior to any test that we do, we need to understand why we're testing and why we're doing that specific test. So if we have a little look at a performance model from an athlete, I've worked with quite a few table tennis athletes and I've asked them the question, what do you think is important to be a good table tennis player? So some of the responses which I've received have varied, but the main ones will be discussed right here now. But they'll say, coach, I need strong legs. Okay, great. But I also need a strong core and a strong back. I need to be fast, so I need to have good speed. And I need to be flexible. And I also need to be good at decision making. Okay, so great. So these are the aspects which athletes are telling me are important. And then when I'm speaking to coaches, they might differ a little bit. So the coach is telling me, actually, timing of the ball is what's important to excel at table tennis. And then I think my athlete needs to be very agile, needs to be very powerful around the table, needs to have a good reaction time, and also needs to be excelling at his service game. So if we then compare what the athletes and coaches are thinking is important. So if you have a look, the dark blue is what the coach deems important and the light gray is what the athlete deems important. So the athlete is telling me technical, tactical aspects are the ones which are the most important when it comes to table tennis. But I don't think nutrition, psychology or mindset reaction and service are actually that important. While the coach is going, do you know what? Tactical, technical are, are important, but service, reaction, mindset, uh, and physiology, nutrition are also very important aspects. You can see that the coach and the athlete is actually differing from what they think plays a major role in excelling at table tennis. So what we should do is actually have a look at the needs analysis. So what do we need be good at table tennis. So we need to understand the game before we provide any recommendation and we do any fitness testing. 
So let's have a look at the movements. So we know the movements are asymmetrical. We know they're unilateral, and we know that there's some symmetrical movements as well to a, to a small extent. The muscles which we're using are core muscles, so stabilization and trunk rotation. We also use these lower limb muscles, especially for propulsion, and this upper body, shoulder, wrist, and even elbow to play table tennis during training and during matches. If we have a look at the game, we know in general that matches are 20 to 50 minutes, that we have three to four shots per rally on average, normally taking about three to four seconds. There's about nine seconds of mean recovery between uh, rallies, and there's different work rest activations based on the opponent that we're playing, but this is usually one, one to three, question mark, with the acts of activation usually also being one. Again, the competition varies with new, numerous games per day. So if we're playing singles, doubles, teams, we know that during a day we might have four or five games. So this is important to understand and important to know. Again, as coaches, as players, we know the equipment. So we know the size of the balls. We know there's a table in the net, etc. We know that there's different rubbers. We know that shoes vary. Again, we have a full understanding of our sport. When we have a look more at a psychological aspect, we know that concentration, alertness, decision making, stress, stress management during competition, motivation, self-confidence, uh, coping skills and anxiety all play a major role on the outcome of our matches. Again, the one which I'm more interested in is, is the one which has just come up now. So is this aerobic capacity. So what are the training and game demands in order for us to excel at table tennis? Again, what is the anaerobic capacity that we need? So what, this explosiveness, this dynamic aspect of the game, again, the lower body strength in order to keep uh, a good posture, the speed, the agility, the reaction time, and the flexibility that we require to be a good table tennis player. Again, other aspects that are important are these training uh, for nutrition, the, the nutrition during competition, our hydration status, what nutrition we should use for recovery, and travel advice, something that has been covered, some of it by myself and some of it by other individuals during the different webinars. So again, this is important to understand. And then again, what is the health of the athlete? So the medical screening, uh, limb asymmetries, and the injury risk or patterns that athletes may have. So let's get back to this coaching approach. So we have an understanding of the performance need and the performance model. So now what we need to do is actually be able to analyze the athlete's level. So how do we do this? So again, we go back to this needs analysis, analysis and assessment, and hopefully you've remembered some of the different things that we discussed a couple of minutes ago. So again, if we're talking about matches, what are we looking at? We're looking at the performance results, the performance KPIs. So what are the actual results of our athletes? Because this is how we assess games. If we then have a look at these psychological aspects, we can quantify and actually assess these through psychomotor screening, maybe some type of interviews and some performance profiling or field observations with the latter possible to be done via taking a camera to matches and the coach actually having look, having a look at the performance of his athlete during different games. Again, if we're looking at these um, movements, having a look at limb asymmetries, maybe the structure and function of the Achilles, pat patella tendon, all these things can be done to actually have a look at our, at our asymmetries between different limbs. Now, the one which I'm interested in and that we'll cover today is these fitness tests. So these field assessments on training drills, so this can be through muscle strength, speed and power, muscle oxygenation, whatever it may be that we require or that we, that we need to understand when it comes to our athletes, and we will discuss this. And then for the medical screening, again, through regular screening, uh, having a look at different training load patterns to understand injury, all these type of things can provide us with more information. 
and then having a look at hydration status, actually looking at what our athlete, athlete is eating and educating our athlete on sleep and nutrition, again, will influence uh, and help us with our assessment of our athlete. Uh, and like I said, what I want to really focus on today is these fitness tests. So this is what we will cover. So if we go back a little bit to uh, our coaching model, so we've now defined the performance model and the needs in regards to our athletes. So we have a full understanding about what is needed to excel. But now what we need to understand is what are the behaviors which actually under, underpin these performance variables. Now we need to define how we coach them, but also how we assess them. It's important to understand that if we want our athlete to become better at agility or flexibility or anaerobic fitness, that we coach them in a specific way so that they can actually become better, but that we also assess them to see whether or not the coaching strategy that we're using is actually working. So testing, why do we actually test? Well, this is a question which is important to understand. We don't just test for the sake of testing. We test because we want to collect information to help us inform both the athlete and ourselves as coaches or practitioners regarding the training and the preparation for competition, because this is why we're playing. We're playing because we want to compete and we want to get good results. So this helps us do what? This helps us actually to find out a little bit more about the information regarding our athlete. So what is our athlete good at? What is our athlete actually bad at? Again, this will provide a measurement which is objective to some of the elements of performance that coaches see, that coaches feel, and that coaches know. So many times I've worked with coaches who, who will tell me that the performance or the fitness level of the athlete is low, and then when he actually gets tested, it's above the target value where he should be at. So what we see, what we feel, what we know is not always correct. And then finally, it also helps us to set standards and actually to compare our athlete to other table tennis athletes within the age categories and within uh, their level of performance. So again, if we have a 12 year old athlete, there's no point in comparing him to someone who's 25 years old, because again, he's going through this maturation stage. So we need to understand what the target and what the level our athlete should actually be at for his age. But it's also important to understand that when we're testing, there needs to be specific criteria. And within those criteria, we have four things which are very, very, very important. So the first one is the specificity of the test. So again, when we're talking about specificity, we're talking that the test should be similar to the sport of table tennis or actually provide us information which is related to our sport, whether it be match related or training related. Then the second one which is important is this validity, which is the amount to which a test measures what it supposedly measures. So if, if I'm a coach or I'm a practitioner and I'm saying this should measure agility, but I'm actually getting leg power, then the test might not be valid. So we need to understand what the validity of the test is. Then the third one, this re reproducibility. So is it reproducible? So if we test it 10 times, will it actually give us the same or a very similar result? If we're getting different results every single time that we're testing, then it might be an issue and the test is not actually reproducible. And then this last one, this sensitivity. So does the test actually reflect improvements in performance? So if we're working specifically on agility with our athlete, and then we do our agility test, but the athlete is not in improving, then we need to question as to whether or not the test that we're using is actually sensitive to uh, that specific testing um, variable. So when it comes to testing results, it's important to understand that these are individual. So there's, they're always individual to the athlete that we've tested. So we should not always compare all the athletes to one another, but we should have markers and we should have benchmarks. And these should serve as a guide to the coach. 
So if an athlete is excelling in a specific uh, variable, variable, but he's lacking a little bit in another, in another, then this is informing us and this is actually providing us with a guide to say, look, we need to focus on the aspect where the athlete is actually uh, not quite excelling or underneath standard values. And then again, we use this to inform our future training and our tournament preparation. So it's important that we don't just test for testing sake, but that we actually use it to inform any practice that we're providing to our athletes in, in, in the future. So then we go back to this coaching approach. Uh, like I said, once we've analyzed and we've done these fitness tests, we need to define the training methodology, define the training means, define, develop the training program, and then we control and review the adaptation. And we'll take a little Q&A after this, and then we'll really focus on analyzing the athlete's fitness levels and the athlete's fitness. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Samuel, for this uh, very great and comprehensive uh, first part of your lecture. And uh, yeah, we have already some questions. Um, yeah. But I would say, but I would say uh, we keep them for later on for the let's say main okay. part of the day because uh, they are more general. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but I also have one question uh, related to this uh, first part of your lecture, and yeah. uh, you, you brought us uh, closer to to the testing needs and and what can be tested, and there are so many things which could be tested. Um, Correct. What is your personal opinion? How often do you shoot the do the testing? You know, I mean, to re related to a reasonable time, you know. Yes. Yeah, so I mean, with, with, with the, one of the issues with table tennis is is that we have a train um, a competition program which tends to be uh, all year round. Uh, so again, to find testing time slots sometimes is not so not so easy. Um, but my recommendation would always be that when we have a specific focus uh, in training, because normally in general, if, as coaches, as practitioners, we tend to have a training block, for example, where we're looking at working on specific aspects. And when it's the start of the competition, competition or competitive season, one of our main aims is obviously to make sure that our athlete is, is physically fit. Um, so what I tend to tend to do or, t or tend to like to do is to ensure that my athlete is meeting all the criteria and the, and the standardized values, which we'll discuss in a little bit, uh, obviously prior to his first competition. And this is normally done through a training block. Um, so I tend to, to test them at the start of the competitive season, if you will. So I get some information about the athlete. If I then see that the athlete is lacking in specific aspects, then again, this can be a focus of training. Um, during during this first part of the year. Okay, thank you. And what what do you think about uh, testing um, at the end of the competition period, or let's say at the end of the season, maybe just to see, you know, um, how maybe they they uh, the level the physical level was reduced because of the the hard practices, you know, also the the tournaments and so on. Yes, yeah, so again, I mean, it gives us good information to get an understanding as well of the effect that, that these competitions are actually having on, on physical performance. And it shows to you that, for example, if you see a reduction at the end of the season and your athlete is not physically fit enough at the start of the season, that he's going to decrease a lot more than the guy who's, who's very physically conditioned. So he's going to have far more of a negative impact uh, being less physically fit than, than the guy who's physically fit and, and who's meeting the standards and the criteria. So over the course of time throughout the competition, he's actually having a negative effect on, on his performance because, again, fitness levels are linked with many different aspects such as concentration, such as decision making, uh, recovery. Um, 
So again, you might see a drop off in performance in the guys which aren't as physically fit as the other ones as the season is going on. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Samuel, for your answer. And um, maybe our ITDF HP Elite coach, Massimo Costantini, has also one question for you. Massimo? Yeah, yeah, coming, coming. Well, very interesting first part, I have to say. Uh, the, 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 the part that attracted me was uh, the, the different uh, uh, perception between the, the the players and the coaches um, and uh, so this give uh, gives the idea that uh, the, the importance of knowing your your athletes and also athletes knowing the coaches you know so in order to have uh, the the better the better understanding so um apart that uh, i don't know maybe maybe samuel is going to <clears throat> to to talk maybe more uh, specifically for the test i was just uh, uh, curious uh, regarding those numbers that he has given uh, uh, with the with the duration of the the, the length of the rally uh, or maybe the number of shots i don't know if this can uh, can uh, uh, be related with also some sort of a test in table tennis uh, linked with the, with the, with the physical you know so uh, it's not that uh, what we call uh, you know the speed uh, you do the test like the 60 meters 30 meters so we have uh, the measure and so on but i was i was just more curious if is is there anything related that some test can be done at the table on the table related to the to the physical condition so it's more uh, connected with techniques and uh, fitness let's say like that uh, good, good question so obviously to do some stuff at the table is very important because again it's highly specific to the sport which again is is gives you a, a valid and reliable result uh, but again, if you're looking at physical fitness, and this is something which I will cover in the in the next few slides, um, to have a look at specific measures of of, of uh, aerobic endurance, even if it's not completely specific to table tennis or or, or at the table, will still provide you with accurate measures uh, re regarding the physical fitness of, of your athletes. Um, because we need to understand as well that in table tennis, like I said, it's very complex. Uh, if we compare the training and the match demands, they're completely different. So in training, we're often training for two, two and a half hours. And then the games are 30 to 50 minutes uh, long if, if we're playing uh, many sets. So again, we're actually training very, very long. For, for matches which are far shorter than our than our training uh, than our training demands. Yeah, thank you, uh, thank you. Yeah, thanks, but I will Sam. cover I will cover more in in the next couple of slides. I'm sure. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> thank you. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Let's thank so you. let's move on. So uh, fitness testing. Again, we go back to the ones which I discussed and which we will focus on today, this aerobic capacity, anaerobic capacity, lower body strength, speed, agility, reaction time, flexibility, because these are the ones which are really important when it comes to uh, excelling at table tennis. So let's focus first on aerobic endurance. But before we talk about testing and what tests we should use, Let's get a little bit more understanding about what it is. So in simple terms, it's basically the ability of our heart and our lungs to get as much oxygen to the muscles so they can work at high intensities and we don't fatigue. But why is it important? Well, it's important because it reflects our cardiovascular and metabolic health. It helps us increase our concentration level, so especially when we've got uh, competition and we're playing, like we said earlier on, three, four games during a day, we don't want to be tired because the fourth game might be in the evening. So if we lose concentration, the likelihood is if the opponent has a higher aerobic endurance, he will, he will beat us because he's able to concentrate and to make the right decision. 
and also because it's actually a very important element when it comes to success in sports. And this includes table tennis. So it's very important if we want to excel to have a good aerobic uh, endurance. So it will actually enable us to recover far quicker when we're in competition. So if we have a little look as to how we assess it, so we can assess it through a beep test or what we call a multi-stage run test. Again, this is when we have uh, a marking over 20 meter, and then we're listening to the sound of a beep, and we have to run back and forth with the timing of the beep. So again, why is it good? Because it's specific. So it's actually specific to the individuals which are improving their aerobic endurance or which take part in continuous table tennis training. And it's also good because of the cost. So it's actually a cost effective measure of assessing estimates of maximal oxygen uptake. So some of the things which aren't so good with it is the environment. So the environment, when lots of people are running together, can actually affect negatively those which are partaking in the beep test or the multi-stage shuttle run test. And again, it, the results can be a little bit subjective. But what I would tell you, this test for children or for younger athletes is very, very valid and reliable. So it's actually very good to use and it's cost effective. So this is a very good thing. Uh, and again, it's validity. So its ability to actually predict VO2 maxes is, is, is very reliable. But if we're having a look at more elite athletes, what can we do? So you can see a couple of pictures on the right. So including myself at the top, actually testing uh, an athlete for VO2 max. So how do we assess maximal oxygen consumption or the VO2 max test as, as we, we might know it better? So again, here we're assessing the maximum volume of oxygen that can be utilized by our body. So this is done through wearing the mask, as you can see the, the picture on the right, and this is taking values of the air that the individual is expiring and taking in and will provide us values at different stages and a maximal um, number, which we then use to inform our training. Again, this is a gold standard for predicting aerobic endurance performance, and it can actually help athletes and coaches to monitor the effectiveness of training. But the problem is this does cost money and not everyone has this equipment available to assess their athletes. But if we have a little bit of a look in, in targets and results of anaerobic endurance. So as we can see, we take an athlete that's 12 years old and an athlete that's senior. And over time, we'd expect our athletes to improve. So for a senior athlete, uh, for the beep test, I'd expect them to be in and around 15.1 uh, for their level and their stage. Why? Because this uh, replicates a VO2 max of 65, which I'd be expecting to find if they're doing a VO2 max specifically. So again, we want our younger athletes to progress over time and actually be able to reach this value or this target value when they're a senior athlete. But if we have a little look at values of athletes and individuals that we have here, so again, if you first have a look at the graph on the left, uh, the blue is the value of the VO2 max, and the orange is the value of the VO2 max based on the multi-stage fitness test or the beep test. So you can see uh, it's pretty accurate, uh, plus minus two milliliters per kilogram per minute. So again, we're seeing that uh, that they correlate quite well. So the information can actually be used. So if we don't have a VO2 max available, again, the beep test can provide us with some very good information. So what are we seeing with our athlete here on the left is that he's in and around the 60 mark and as Corona or, or the pandemic hit, obviously with the reduction in training time and the reduction in training hours, this has actually decreased a little bit, but his current result, which was done a couple of weeks ago, uh, through, again, training more regularly, has him back at 61.4 milliliters per kilogram per minute. And if we then have a look at a squad of athletes, we can see over different age groups, 
that again, the very young ones who are 12 to 13 years old tend to be far below their target values. And as they're growing older and, and they're getting to senior level, they, they tend to be hitting uh, their requirements uh, and their values very, very closely. So again, this is a good thing. As we're maturing and as our training is improving, so will our scores for, for VO2 or for, for aerobic endurance. But if we have athletes which are lacking uh, in aerobic endurance, what can we actually do to improve them? So it's important to understand that through high intensity interval training, we can actually improve our aerobic endurance. So what does this mean? Well, we've, have a look, we've had a look at studies and many studies have proved that high aerobic intensity endurance interval training is more effective than performing uh, long runs at 70% of our heart rate max. So long steady runs will not improve our aerobic performance as much as high intensity interval training. So these short, sharp bursts or sprints that we're doing with minimal recovery time will actually help us with our aerobic endurance. What else can be done? So anaerobic training, short lasting high intensity activity, where the body's demand for oxygen exceeds the amount of oxygen that is available, again, will help us improve with our aerobic endurance. But now we move on. Let's move on to anaerobic endurance. So this is often something which is neglected to focus on the te technical and tactical training skills within table tennis. So often we're actually neglecting this, even though it's very important for our athletes to have a good anaerobic endurance to excel at the sport. But what is it? So it's basically these activities which are very short of length, which are very highly intensive, which occur during table tennis matches. So when we're performing anaerobic exercises, we're actually not using oxygen, unlike the aerobic exercise or the aerobic capacity that we just discussed. But why is it important? Because it plays an important role in these short periods of brief efforts. Again, our matches are characterized by the above. So again, that's why it's very important. And also it can be the difference between winning or losing a rally. Because the quicker that we can recover and the better that we can maintain this maximal amount of uh, anaerobic endurance, the more likelihood we are to be successful. So if we have a little bit of a look at what we can do, so how can we assess it? Let's have a look at this cost effective or this very basic one. So a 10 times five meter sprint. Why a five meter sprint? Because this is the most closely related table tennis. If we're going further than a five meter sprint, again, we're losing this specific aspect or the short run, short distances that we're using in table tennis. Again, why is it good? Because it's specific, it's a measure of an aerobic capacity and it's also part of this standardized Eurofit testing battery. So this means that we have lots of information available and lots of results uh, which are based on other individuals and other athletes which are within this Eurofit testing battery. Again, the cost like we discussed, so it's a very cost effective measure to actually assess anaerobic endurance. But what is bad about it? It only really gives us basic values related to anaerobic capacity. And there are some errors related to measurements, because if we have a look at the picture at the top on the right, using a stopwatch, again, there is some measure as to when we're starting, when we're stopping, based on, on, on the athlete crossing the, the sprint line. Uh, so one which I tend to use, again, because I'm very lucky, uh, to have these, this equipment available within the uh, academy that I work at is this bike on the right. So what I do is a 40, 30, 30 anaerobic capacity test. Why? Because it's an extremely popular field test, which has been used for the analysis of many athletes. So there's lots of information available. Uh, again, it prov provides me with findings related not only to their anaerobic power, per kilogram body mass, but also their maximal power. So is the work in the gym with the SNC coach or the table tennis coach actually working? And it also provides me some measure of fatigue. So again, this is specific to lower body. 
So again, very specific to racket sports because the lo lower body is what we're using to move around the table or move around the court if we're involved with uh, other racket sports. So this is why I tend to use uh, anaerobic endurance 40-30-30 uh, as my test of choice. But again, if we have a look at results, so on the left, you can see these values zero to nine. So the, the values which we're getting from the uh, anaerobic, uh, from the anaerobic, sorry, not aerobic, so anaerobic endurance test is uh, related to uh, watts per kilogram of body weight. So again, you can see that individuals tend to neglect this within their training. If we have a look at our latest results in September 2021, not a single individual is actually meeting their target. One of the reasons, again, has been due to them not being able to uh, perform uh, anaerobic training because obviously the academy has been closed and uh, regular training has not occurred. So again, you can see they're below this benchmark or below where they should be according to their ages. What can we do to actually improve this? Again, to improve this, we can use this high intensity interval training. They're so using short bursts of intense exercise, perform that around 80 to 90% of your maximum heart rate, such as repeated sprints, will actually help us improve our anaerobic endurance and also through strength training. So performing a minimum of two 30-minute gym sessions that focus on all the major muscle groups will actually help us uh, with our anaerobic endurance. So this is important to actually note, we should be doing strength training with our athletes. So our athletes should not only be playing table tennis, they should be spending time in the gym lifting weights, but obviously doing this with uh, care and with the correct technique because we don't want them to get injured. So now we move on to agility. So for agility, I'm going to focus a little bit more on how we set this test up and uh, what the values actually mean. So again, what is it? It's the ability to make quick changes of direction while moving at speed around the table. Why is it important? Because it improves our flexibility, our balance and our control. And it also helps us maintain proper alignment and posture during movement. It encourages our body to learn how to maintain correct body placement, something which is very important when it comes to table tennis by maintaining this body posture in and around the table. How can we assess it? So a very simple measure that we can use and which is very specific to table tennis is lateral agility. As you can see on the picture on the right, it's an individual which is shuffling left to right, but we'll discuss this in a little bit more, more detail now, uh, over three meters. So what is the method? So we set up two lines with cones four meters apart. We instruct the athlete that the starting point for the test is either to the left or the right of the line, and that the athlete must ensure that one foot is always placed on or over the line. Again, the athlete should shuffle to the opposite line and back a total of three times. And for it to be a valid trial, the foot must be placed on or over the line for it to be successful. Again, the assistant or the coach or the practitioner will provide the signal of when to start and will make sure that the stopwatch is started and stopped simultaneously. Once three successful lateral shuffles have been conducted, the stopwatch can be stopped, the athlete is provided with a recovery period, and we repeat this a total of three times with approximately three minutes rest. So again, this is taking no longer than five to 10 minutes because when one athlete is resting, the other athlete can actually start. But there needs to be some tester checks. So we must make sure that our athlete is actually shuffling laterally because what we tend to see is that athletes like to cheat because they want a better time. So they'll cross over with their feet. Again, crossover is not good at the table and crossover is not good when we're performing this test. So again, we need to make sure that it's lateral shuffling. Again, as we mentioned before, the foot must be on or over the line for it to be valid. 
and if it's not placed on the line, it's an invalid lateral shuffle, and it doesn't count. Again, the athlete must always face forward during the test, so he shouldn't be looking sideways. And again, the time is only stopped once it's six successful lateral shuffles which have been achieved. And then the scoring, the best time from the three uh, trials that the athlete has completed will act as their testing measure. But if we have a look at some of the information which has been collected here, so we have this athlete A and this athlete B. So what can we see? We can see that athlete A improves over time because his time is going down, and athlete B increase, uh, actually becomes worse and then improves over, over the next trials. So why is this? Well, athlete B had a de uh, athlete A, sorry, had a decrease in training time and then also had an injury. So after the injury, they actually be became worse. And then as they came back into training and had a focus with the SNC coach and uh, the table tennis coach actually improved again over time. So this is what we'd expect and this is what we like to see. So if we now have a look at some agility, which is really specific to table tennis. So we have this table tennis specific agility test that we can use. So again, this is a test that assesses speed, agility, but around the table tennis table. It includes forward, lateral and backward movements and also assesses a player's change of direction combined with speed. So again, good results within this agility, agility test will also show good body balance, coordination, speed, but also in general table tennis skills. So if we have a little bit of a look at the setup, so we're lucky enough that we, we work with uh, biomechanists here at Aspire Academy, and we actually have access to individuals which have looked at uh, match demands and created a test which is very specific to the needs and demands of junior table tennis players. So if we have a look at the table tennis, uh, at the procedure for this test, again, the athlete is performing three trials, and he starts with his foot behind uh, line A with a service ready return position. And he gets told that he must perform the test as quickly as possible. And he will then move forward and lunge to hit ball A, which is near the net, as you can see. Then he will jump backwards and play a backhand drive against stroke B. And then without stopping, he will make a pivot to hit ball B again with a forehand stroke drive and then move laterally to hit ball C with a forehand drive or what we call a, a wide forehand. Uh, he will then move back to the middle and then once he's moved to the middle, uh, the timer will be stopped. So again, this is providing us information, not only uh, of the agility of the athlete, but also his movement and his movement skills, because we tend to take a video or a camera of how the athlete is moving. So we, what we tend to find is the younger they are, the worse the agility because the movement skills are not so good. And as they uh, mature and as they're doing more uh, specific training and specific drills, the better the agility. So how can we improve agility? So through sprint training, agility training workouts, so foot, foot speed and agility for any athlete who needs to be explosive uh, and quick is obviously a great way doing agility exercises within our warm-up, within our training. So zigzag drills, T drills, lateral agility, forwards, backwards sprinting. And again, within the table tennis training, where we're incorporating our specific movements when our athletes are not too fatigued, because this is important as well. If we have a look now at speed and power, what we can do is something that we call a counter movement jump. So this is a vertical jump by jumping as high as we can, which assesses the explosive power of our lower legs. And it will also estimate the vertical or maximal vertical di displacement with or without arm swing, dependent on what you want to use. Again, we can do this using a jumping mat, which will give us instant values, or we can even do this by jumping against the wall and actually seeing how high the athlete can jump. So again, we can do this with cheap methods and we can do this with more expensive methods. 
And again, this the athlete will do it three times with some rest in between, and then we can use this for further analysis and also for training provision. So again, if we have a look at the methodology, we, we instruct the athlete to stand with his hands on his hips, maintain this position for the duration of the jump, and then jump or go down and jump as high as possible up in the air. Uh, we also instruct the athlete to make sure that he lands uh, fully upright on the balls of his feet and that there's some form of bending the knee to make sure that the impact is not too high. And again, we should provide at least 30 seconds of rest in between each trial. So if we then have a look at some of the values, as you can see, these are the target scores that I would use for athletes of different ages on the right. And as you can see, the more uh, in-depth or specific training that the athlete is receiving as he goes up in age, the better the CMJ or the uh, speed and power scores of the athletes that I'm working with. But what are some of the other measures that we can use? So important for table tennis is flexibility aspect. So maybe a sit and reach test. Again, the only thing that we need for this is a box and a tape measure. So again, this is very cheap and provides us good information. Why? Because it's a common measure of flexibility and provides us measures related to lower back and hamstring muscles. Again, this is important because tightness in this area results in potential lumbar lordosis, uh, forward pelvic tilt and lower back pain, all of which is affecting table tennis performance and, and, and training at the, uh, at the table. Then the next one that we can look at is leg strength, so leg press. Again, if we have this information available, great. Again, the purpose to perform an athlete's single leg strength uh, and seeing what this value is. Again, this is best to do with someone who's a qualified practitioner within strength and conditioning uh, or a coach which has knowledge in sports science or has knowledge of uh, providing uh, fitness support or, or SNC support to his athletes. Again, what we want to know is how much can our athlete lift for one repetition. Again, this is better to be done with these elite athletes or these older athletes because we don't want our younger athletes to get injured uh, through bad technique or through lifting uh, weights which are too heavy. Um, again, we also need to do this while we're not fatigued because otherwise we won't have an accurate value. Then other measures that we can use, reactiveness, so drop jump. So we're talking about jumping off or falling off a uh, platform onto the floor and then jumping as, as high as possible while keeping our hands on our hips. So again, this gives us information regarding leg power and reactiveness and is very useful, especially if, if we're working with these elite or older athletes. Then we can have a look for our younger athletes at reaction time and coordination. So something that we can do is a table tennis specific tapping test. So this is by reacting and having a look at what our upper body reaction time is, our hand eye quickness and our coordination by placing our right hand and tapping the marker on the right and then the left without moving our left hand from, from, from its position in the middle and seeing how many times we can actually tap it within a 30 second period. Again, something that we can use also for our younger athletes just to have a look at coordination is this backward polygon track. So this is just assessing body coordination and facial aware awareness in our younger athletes to see whether or not they can actually move correctly. So I know that the Olympics has uh, and the Paralympics has, has finished not so long ago. So if we're working with our para TT athletes, there's other considerations that we obviously need to take into account. But what do we need to consider? Well, we need to understand the full level of impairment of our athlete. So if, if our athlete cannot run, we cannot ask him to do a beep test. So obviously we need to find a different alternative. We need to help determine the level of fitness, the ability to perform these specific tests, what the straining strategies are based on their category of impairment. 
Uh, again, what tests can we use to ensure that we have these specific and valid values for our athletes? Again, we also need to understand that there are increased injury risks uh, of sports-related injuries when we, we are working with these individuals. So again, we need to be sure that the test that we're providing is not going to result in an injury. And we also need to understand that impairments are often affecting both the upper and lower extremities. So if we have someone who's impaired in the upper body, then we need to focus more on the lower body as our test. And if it's lower body, then we need to have more of a focus on the upper body. But we should also be testing our para athletes and providing them with information to enhance our coaching and our coaching strategies. So now when we go back to this coaching approach, we've done our control and our review of our adaptations and gone through this method methodology. So then we go back to analyzing our athletes level because this isn't going to inform further our training methodology means and training program. So we need to make sure that it's evidence-based. So training structures and planning allows us to know where we are going to build our map of creating this top table tennis athlete and how we get there. Also, we can have a plan of where interventions are needed and when, based on the findings that we have from our testing specific uh, criteria. And then we can also check if our athletes are aware of their strengths and weaknesses according to this performance model, where we compare the ones from our athlete and from our coach. Uh, we can then also make sure that support is given where and when it matters and check if it works. And we also need to be sure and uh, positive uh, about our ability to change our plan if something is not working. Uh, and also critically assessing how much time we need to spend, we should spend in key aspects uh, through knowing the demands and understanding the demands of the sport, because this is what makes coaching or supporting athletes uh, and art. So our aim is obviously to get this individual to become the number one or, or, or successful within competitions and, and, and within, uh, within these competition demands over the course of a year, but also the course of his career. Thank you. And also please feel free uh, to take my email if you have any further questions and uh, drop me a message as well. Samuel, thank you so much for your comprehensive lecture as usual and for giving us uh, this many information, you know, and of course also sharing your vast knowledge. This is, yeah, very, very fruitful for all of us. And uh, we do have some questions for you. And okay. uh, I would like to start with a question from uh, Sima Limoki. And yeah. she says, uh, Dear Samuel, Thank you very much for your presentation. Please advise about physical tests for under 14 years old players, girls and boys. I mean, you mentioned that some of their tests, they are, can be useful, let's say, or they are unable to do with the youngest and some may not. Yeah. So maybe. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, again, going through obviously the basic demands and the needs. Uh, of table tennis, like I mentioned to Massimo earlier on, we know that table tennis is is complex and it is actually quite a difficult sport to understand because, again, like I said, we're training for these long periods, but our games are very short. Uh, so we actually need to excel both in this anaerobic and aerobic uh, aspect in, in order to be a good table tennis player because to train for two hours, you need to have a good physical fitness. And to maintain good quality training, you need to have a good physical fitness. But the demands of table tennis require us to be very good for these short bursts of time, where we then have a longer recovery, and we come back to the short bursts of time. So targeting these specific aspects related to aerobic and anaerobic endurance should be the minimum requirement that we, that we actually follow uh, as coaches and as practitioners, because this is providing us with good information. And then some of the other tests that, that, that are so easy and so quick to, to perform, such as agility, flexibility, uh, can easily be incorporated within our, within our schedule. 
Okay, thank you, thank you very much, uh, Samuel, uh, for this uh, great answer. And I have uh, one more question for yeah. you before I will pass the word to Massimo. Um, you also mentioned, uh, you know, uh, testing batteries or maybe all what you, let's say, uh, you know, brought closer to us can be seen as a test battery. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, correct. Very much aware, or we are very much aware of the importance of the testing batteries. Like they are for sure a, a puzzle piece in in the athlete success. Yeah. Um, what do you think? Uh, because I also created one testing battery. What do you think? How many tests can be included in one testing battery? Or should so, be? Or should... Yeah. So I mean, I, I I would I would definitely focus on the ones which are very very important when it comes to the sport and sporting demand. So like I said, this anaerobic, aerobic, uh, flexibility, agility, but also something related to this lower limb uh, aspect, lower limb strength, speed, power, uh, should really be the basic requirement. Then again, if we're working with the athletes as they're maturing and getting older and, and we start changing the focus of training, so for example, when we have an athlete which is now mature, and we're really doing some specific SNC strength and conditioning, then again, we should also be incorporating stuff such as lower muscle strength to get an understanding, is the training that we're providing to them actually working? Because this is the only way to, to understand whether our training procedure is actually working and beneficial uh, for, the, for the athlete. But again, something I would like to mention is if we're finding the results are not changing this is not a bad thing because again these results are informing the training that we're providing to the athlete so it should never be seen as a negative thing uh, it should be seen as something which helps us to actually provide better support and better training uh, provision to, to to the athletes that we're working with thank you samuel and now i pass the word to massimo Yes, it, again, interesting, uh, well, something that we we are dealing every day, you know, with uh, uh, with what we do in the training and what the, actually is uh, the, the match, you know, so this one is related. I remember, just to give you an example, um, the, 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 the boxing, the boxing uh, athletes, uh, they, they have to perform this three minutes, <laughs> three minutes round. And uh, actually, their preparation, the, the test, everything they do is based on uh, on these three minutes with the uh, recovery and so on. Uh, our our game, our sport is very atypical, as you said, uh, made with super complex. Uh, sometimes uh, abilities are more important than uh, uh, than uh, physical abilities. Let's say on the the end, the yes. racket, and so on. So. The complexity of the sport is out is out of discussion. Um, the the one thing that maybe I don't know if uh, um, you you already mentioned uh, uh, is the is the reflexes. Uh, the the reflexes is a, is a very important uh, thing that uh, uh, players they use a lot, you know. But not only not only the the top players, the average player, even the beginners, the beginners. So. Is there anything that uh, uh, the, the, the players can assess uh, or coaches can assess or uh, maybe can make it better on the table or off the table? Uh, how to detect a certain uh, lack of reflexes uh, and uh, accordingly also uh, uh, late movement and the delay of the, the, the movement? Is there anything you can tell us about this? Yes, yeah, so again, I mean, th th there are lots of uh, tests which are available, which which are related to light triggers to obviously okay. assess whether or not our athlete actually has a good reflex time and reaction time. Uh, but, but certainly, I think it's very important to incorporate this uh, a little bit like the lecture uh, that I had uh, a few months ago within the warm up, because, again, this can be sort of our last part or first part of training, last part of the warm up last first part of training where we can have triggers with different colored cones uh, because again the player needs to react needs to show reflex according to the color of the cone as to where he needs to move 
then if we want to increase the complexity a little bit, we can tell our athletes, look, if I give you yellow, you have to go to blue. And if I give you blue, you have to go to yellow. So now you're making it a little bit more difficult. And again, this concentration level of the athlete needs to change and adapt a little bit according to your according to your trigger. So there's lots of exercises that we can actually incorporate with it within our warm up slash first part of training and also tests that we can use to have a look at have a look at reaction time to help us understand the athlete a little bit better. Good. But again, like Good. you said, the complexity of the game will also influence uh, the reaction time, because if we're a, a beginner or a younger player, sometimes we don't really understand the bounce of the ball or the spin of the ball. So again, yeah. this comes through practice as well. So this is something where I think coaches need to concentrate sometimes a little bit more on to explain to the athletes what the different rotations mean when the different arm swings are coming for a service, what, what the rotation will actually end up as. Uh, because when we're younger, sometimes we cannot see with as much detail because we don't have that experience. But as a coach, we expect the player to know. So our job as a coach, as a practitioner, is also to inform the players and actually help the players uh, understand the game better, if you will. Yeah, but uh, as we said, we, we don't want to scare. We don't want to scare the audience that the table tennis is, is super complex, uh, super difficult, super super. It's the beauty actually of the table tennis. <laughs> so, just to make them uh, comfortable, you know. So uh, please welcome all these kind of things that uh, is really really fascinating. So Dominic, uh, maybe uh, back to you uh, to conclude uh, this, uh, as usual, great uh, webinar uh, from Samuel. Please go ahead. Thank you very much, uh, Massimo. And uh, of course, uh, we want to thank you now, dear Samo. We, the entire ITTF HPD team, we want to thank you a lot for taking the time to be here with us today and for sharing your vast knowledge, experience and expertise regarding today's topic, physical testing needs in table tennis. So thank you very much. Thank you for having me. And uh, like I said, if anyone has any uh, additional uh, questions, please feel free to send me an email and I will respond, obviously, in, 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 in due course with some additional information or, or questions uh, that you may have. Thanks also for this commitment and uh, yeah, also a big thanks uh, to our audience for attending and we hope our 52nd IDDF HPD Table Tennis at Your Fingertips webinar was very interesting and uh, of course also very educational for you. And I'm looking forward uh, to our future webinars and the next one will follow very soon, better said next uh, Wednesday, the 6th October at uh, 5 p.m. Central European Summertime, and the topic will be Tokyo 2020 Paralympic Games. So don't forget to sign up and enjoy this great webinar. And that's all from my side for today. Stay safe and healthy, and I pass the word to Italy, to Massimo, and kindly ask you, Massimo, for your closing words. Thank you. Bye. Yeah, as usual, thank you, Dominic. Great lecture from uh, Samuel is uh, is an uh, unlimited knowledge uh, person with so many things to learn. And actually, we have seen from the from the chat uh, that there was a really a great appreciation of uh, of his lecture, and uh, we also we are grateful to him, uh, and we are lucky also to have him uh, uh, in our uh, in our webinar. So thank you very much, Samuel. Thank you, Dominic. Uh, thank you all uh, being on the other side, wherever you are, and uh, we'll uh, in touch for the next uh, webinar. Thank you very much. See you. Bye bye. Ciao. Bye bye. See you guys.